I know uh, I will don't be shy, you can you can come. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so yeah, as Lucy said, uh, thanks for coming tonight. Uh, that's my first talk, so it's gonna be a lot of information, but I'm gonna try to keep it uh, as simple as I can. Um, so tonight I'm going to talk about scalability on the iOS app. So we often talk about like scalability on the front end, uh, on the back end side, like APIs and like things like that. Um, but we talk much less about um, the mobile app and the code behind and like how we can make sure that uh, it goes as well with the team. Like, what about like if your team double tomorrow? Like, are you sure you can ship it as good as today? So that's what we're gonna um, cover tonight. But first, uh, let me introduce myself. So my name is Ben. I'm one of the iOS developer here at Zara. Um, if you can't tell by my accent, I'm French. And when I'm not writing code here, uh, I'm also blogging about uh, iOS development in general. Back to our subject. So first, we're gonna see what is scalability and why it's so important to anticipate it. Then I'm gonna share some tools and tips about like how you manage your code base as well as your project. And finally, how automation can assist you uh, in that journey. Okay, let's start with what. So what is scalability? Scalability is the property of a system to handle a growing amount of work by adding resources to that system. So that's like definition by Wikipedia, that's not mine. Um, <clears throat> what does it mean is like, if you got more users tomorrow, you'll like still be able to adapt to make sure that, for instance, your API so you're going to be able to uh, take care of all this flow. On the front end side, like on the iOS part, um, I kind of like interpret it differently. It's like if, you, if your team grows, um, does like your code quality stay the same? Um, can, can you ship as fast as, as usual and so on? Especially like if you move from like two people to 10 people to maybe 100 people, as I heard uh, uh, earlier. So that's it's, it's still like something very important. So let's see let's see what we can do for this. Um, what about the why? So I think it's something we always experienced before, where we start working uh, on like a small project, and maybe with, like one or two developers, then you're very like feature focused, no time for uh, documentation, comments, unit tests. Maybe you're like, oh yeah, I'll do that later. And then um, time pass, and like team grows. And then you like 10 developers. It's like a lot of code added every day. Um, everybody has like his different code style. And you're like, wait, well, uh, it's really difficult to review your code. It's maybe like difficult to review mine. And it's kind of like, you become a mess. And there's no like proper direction of your project. You're like, wait, what are we talking about? Like, is it like testable? Is it like performance? It's very difficult to just see like, can, can we actually do that? And um, that became a real problem. And we're just talking about like moving to two from, from two to ten people. What about like the next ten? What about like hundred more? So we need a plan. <laughs> um, so if you don't know where to start, the easiest way to start is probably to make sure that the code you're gonna add tomorrow is as clean as possible, so that at least you like got something new and like quite fresh in the side. So the first rule might be just like define your own style guide. We make sure like every iOS developer in your, in your team uh, speak the same language. So the style guide is just like a set of um, basic rules to make sure that um, um, could be like naming convention, it could be like uh, using a specific pattern or another one, uh, just like maybe comments or indentation. Um, so you don't need to create your own style guide from scratch. You can just use like some existing one. So for instance, Google has like a Swift style guide. You can just reuse it, adapt it, and just like check with your team and say like, okay, this is a good rule. We should enforce this. This is like we can just ignore it for now. But that's still like a lot of rules that every developer has to think about. So like, wait, what about naming conversion? What was it again? So. To kind of like enforce these kind of rules, you can use uh, lint tools such as Swift Lint or Swift Formats to make sure that any kind of new code kind of like gonna go through this and 
um, just like maybe read them, maybe like uh, create warnings or even like arrows at real time to make sure that you can't just go further with that code because it's against our style guide. Um, so what I put on the side is just like Swiftlint and Swift formats uh, use like a config file, so you can just adapt it and say like I want this rule, I don't want that one, and so on. Then come like best practice versus mainstream one. What I call mainstream is like it's not because Facebook or Google are using like specific tools that you have to use the same one, and that's kind of like goes against best practices. So for instance, uh, here that are we use. Um, let's say MVVM and RX Swift, but that doesn't mean like you have to use MVVM and RX Swift. It just like it kind of fits our purpose and fits like a specific problem we had, and we wanted to make it testable. And like testability is like would be the best practice, but maybe like tomorrow we won't be MVVM, or maybe it would be let's say Viper or like any other things. So you have to kind of like adapt and make sure your project kind of like address the right problem. And not like, you know, you cannot like take somebody else's solution to address any kind of problem. Um, so that's true like for best practice, but that's also true for your any iOS architecture. Which kind of like simulate like yeah, you don't need like you know, get the big guns for like a simple maybe like a small a smaller one could fit. So we saw like what we can do for the code days. Um, so let's see like what we can do for the project, like just like files and folders. So after a couple of years, maybe a project looked like this. So you started like view, view model, maybe like model folders, and then just like get crowded. Like you got like more and more uh, files and folders all over the place, and it's really difficult to find anything. And maybe you're just lucky and you say like, oh, this is that place. So like you've got shortcuts, but for new joiners, it's still like it's a bit of a mess. Um, so let's see what we can do for that. Um, so first it would be just try to reorganize files and folders. It might don't take much of your time, but just like for the next one, they'll be like, oh yeah, thanks, at least that's clean. Um, you don't need to come with like a proper folder system, just maybe like you can check some of those already existing. For instance, uh, uh, Kickstarter iOS is open source, and you can see like the templates, the documentation, and how they manage this. You say like, oh yeah, maybe I should do the same, like, right? that sounds great. Um, the other part is with a growing team, you might have like some conflicts, and like a recurring one might be like your Xcode project file itself, which is like a massive XML. If you've got like many targets, every time you add a file and somebody else has a file at the same time in another branch, you're gonna have like more conflicts and so on and so on. So one way to tackle this is um, to actually use uh, Xcode Gen or XK or any kind of like extra project generator. So it kind of like plays on like a YAML file, which is way easier first um, to review and get up like any conflicts. And especially it's based on the project folder. So every time you're gonna regenerate your project, you're actually gonna get like what point in the project itself instead of like just keeping reference from like previous commits. Finally, dependencies. So I think that's something we'll use, CocoaPos, Cartage, Swift Packet Manager, maybe Git sub modules. Um, <coughs> it's, um, it's kind of like best practice in the way that you're gonna try to break down your massive 1005 application into like smaller pieces, like reusable, testable, and so on. And that's uh, something we do, obviously, at Zara. But we also break down like different other pieces. For instance, uh, the same as like a style guide uh, for our code, we define also a UI style guide. So that we can make like all the UI components reusable across any kind of like project platforms, which makes it like way easier uh, for new joiners to just like drag and drop which one I want. Okay, now talking about UI. Um, so in iOS, uh, there is like three main ways to deal with this. Either like using storyboard, using like zip file, or just like programmatic way. And if you're like a growing team, you might be like, yeah, storyboard like is good, um, can process out faster, and so we did. And we also got definitely a problem like merging config the same way, where um, 
two, two developers couldn't work on the same storyboard without creating conflicts. So we just like went back to like programmatical way. Um, so that's just like an example. We said like maybe I'm gonna save some time at first for like prototyping and like doing my MVP, but maybe it's like this time that you're gonna waste later. And maybe it's gonna be six months later, maybe it's gonna be two years later. But uh, you might just want to like think about first and say like where where we're going with that solution. Finally, asset and localization. So if like same as Zara, you got like multiple um, local uh, language supported. So I think Zara will be like five or six. Um, so it's like a lot of strings to uh, manage. And it's just like copy pasting. You might like miss a typo, it's hard to review, you're not even sure. If you got like 10, 10 files to review, um, I mean, it, again, it's difficult, like a lot of efforts for reviewer, for the developer, tester, and so on. And it's something like assets. Um, everything is like based on like a, a string base. Uh, you could just resolve that using uh, Swift Gen, which is like a simple tool that actually can help you uh, create structs and enums uh, for you to just like autocomplete and make it like all your like localization file assets, even like storyboards, color, fonts, all these kind of elements uh, to your developers. So that like again, any new joiners, if like your team grow, you got your style guide, you got like all of these discoverable just from like auto completion, it makes it like way easier. So hopefully, with like some time and efforts, you got something like that. They like organize everything at this place. It's easy for new joiners to just like pick up the right elements, support it, test it, and so on. So that's what we aim for. So we saw like a bunch of tools to see like and practices to see like how we can make like our code and our project better for tomorrow. And um, basically like one manual. Say like, okay, I need to like do swim gen, I need to like do maybe export gen, I need to like go through Swift formats. Um, so let's see like how automation can help us in that. So maybe like the first step would be just like to use some like scripting uh, uh, tool. Um, so yeah, like one of the uh, most popular would be Fastlane. Um, but you might just want to think about like, wait, do I want like dependencies on Ruby, like some private APIs? Maybe like you're not, um, you want to like think about first, and not because like everybody uses Fastlane, that again, you have to use it. It's more like, okay, maybe with like some uh, customized scripts, I can do the same, and like less risk uh, of breaking because they don't like extra command line, for instance. Um, there's more and more people moving from Fastlane to Bezo and like all the kind of tools uh, that can help you uh, do that. Again, after that, you've got like scripting automation. You can just like press the button, it's gonna like, build, uh, test, and deploy for you. So it's just good time to like do that on another laptop, not your machine anymore, but like maybe Jenkins, maybe Cycle CI, uh, and so on. Finally, you can just like do everything together using Geekflow to make sure that any new code added to your project automatically can like trigger new builds and maybe like uh, verify your code and your code base. One thing that you might want to use is actually uh, add extra steps to your Geekflow. Um, so for instance, here at Zara we use uh, Danger. I don't know if you guys know about it. Uh, but you kind of like easily uh, check the size of your uh, pull request. If it's too long, you can like raise a warning, or if you just like um, miss uh, unit test it, um, and that's like a best practice you want to enforce. And if like any dependency has been moved, and it's kind of like where you have to like verify any other pull request, just kind of like related to the main one. Uh, last thing uh, for the mission tool, uh, I can't ignore is just crash reports. So you have to like all your symbolic. If you uh, let's go back, um, your application might crash at some point. You want just to be notified, but because every time you like build a new app, you need to like upload your like symbolic files to your crash reporter to make sure like you got all the stack trace. And that's something you also want to automate at some point. So let's just show that this part is also part of your flow. Okay, so that's like a lot of information. I feel like everybody like, wait, what are you talking about? 
Um, so let me show you quickly uh, what we can do with like a uh, couple of things. Uh, the right one. Okay, so I've got one project uh, that I'm just going to copy paste. Can you guys see? Oh, sorry. Okay. So far. Okay, so here we won't um, pay attention to like architecture, architecture, we're just gonna ignore that because it's not might be like different. So I just I want to show you so I've got an application where I've got a list of strings and then when I click on it I go to a detail page with like an image, very basic app. So can you see it? Yes. Okay. So I got like some string when I click on it, I can see a picture. Okay, looks looks okay -ish. But wait, so here like we got start having typo. So localization become a problem and assets are also dynamic strings. So let's see how we can do um, to just avoid like this kind of content um when we're on top. So, I'm gonna so, put sorry, do you need the screen bigger because it's very high? Sure. Change the resolution with the same thing. Uh, oh, this one. Yeah. Change the font Yeah. If you change the the display set to D, everything will be you can see everything. I'm afraid that would interfere with the recording. Oh, yeah. Okay. Can you see now? Uh, okay. Right. So first thing is like bad luck. Somebody like indented before you, and it's kind of like it can't read anything. So I'm just gonna like show you how Swiftly can do that. Obviously, you could just like indent with Icon, but. The idea is like show you an uh, alternative solution. Sweet format can like do way more, but it just like give you like some tools and tips. Can you guys still see? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so, so far I'm just like in a project and there is like my code behind and I'm just gonna like try to reformat all the projects. And that's it. So I just like reindance, but also gonna like check for all the warnings, uh, maybe like uh, some calls, practices. So everything you can enforce based on that. So the second part was uh, all the like translation and like all the localizable strings. So I've got like some strings here, but bad luck, like somebody like copy pasting wrongly and it become like a problem. So what I'm gonna do is like use um, um, Swift gen to like actually create like assets and also localization, localization string based on this. Um, so to do that, I'm just gonna Reuse one prepared, obviously. Sweet gen, that YAML file. And Swift. Then, so because I create like a configuration file for it, then it's just gonna like pick up the configuration file and uh, execute everything. If you look into this um, slightly closer, I'm just like giving like the inputs of where is my string localization, the same as my assets, and where I want the outputs to be. And then I'm just gonna run it. Obviously there's an error. Just created a 
good roll, please. Oops, sorry. Okay, so I created two files. Uh, we can't see straight in the code because it's not automatically imported, but here they are. So one is like the strings, and let me just show you and um, import this one. So you automatically generate like localization um, in your based on like what I had before. So now I can just um, replace it in my contents. Good morning. Okay, I'm gonna do the same for the assets. Okay, the same for the asset, like this is like my generated file. So every time I'm gonna have like new localization, new assets, I just need to like rerun the same thing and I can just reuse it. And I'm gonna have my assets, I'm gonna just keep the same because I got like the image name, I'm just gonna use image name as well. And last image. Okay, so now we're gonna just like check that everything is working, but also in French, because, well, I'm concerned for my uh, French users. And let's build it again. Cool. So now everything got picked up, so automatically localization, everything is like auto-completion, uh, so easier, easier to find for your users, uh, for your developers, sorry. And also, like the, the images still match, so it's kind of like safer uh, on the development side. So, like the developer experience just like increase uh, quite quickly. And the last thing I wanted to show you is uh, Xcodegen. So let me clear that. So one thing is like my project here. I'm just gonna remove the Xcode project file, and I'm just gonna move around the assets from one file, one folder to another, uh, just to show you like how does it work. So for Xcode project, you're gonna like, create like a YAML file, like describe what's the content of your project file itself. So I'm just gonna create my configuration. So here you can see, um, Oh yeah, okay, we are already at the bottom of the page. So here you can see like my, the name of my application, that's uh, one target gonna be application iOS with like deployment targets, and the other one gonna be uh, a name, um, sorry, a test target, and like, like the folder that's gonna be picked. So let's see how it goes in the app. Okay, and now Xcode Gen generates. Okay, so now I created like the project. Thing is like, I used spot file before, so I still need to run for the install on top of it, just to make sure like everything gonna be picked up. And then my project is regenerated. And, okay, the thing is like, we can't see very well, but now in localization, I got my assets. So that's mean like, that's mean like based on my uh, configuration and my uh, project, uh, my folder structure, um, the project has been like just reorganized and everything, everything is back there. Uh, the good thing about this is uh, you can actually remove your Xcode project from like your Git repo and like eventually just um, in, in your steps, just like rebuilding every time you need it. So it's kind of like safer again for your developers, but also depending on like the size of the team. But if you like 100 developers, that might be something you want to look into. No. no. Okay. So 
In conclusion, um, we define like some uh, code rules and standards for your team to kind of like follow and like make it easier for your developer uh, to have like a direction for your project. Uh, we also see how to organize uh, either like your code base, your project, localization, assets, all these kind of like elements that make it maybe just painful for you today. And we saw some uh, how to set up some tools and workflow to um, just like remove all that pain. It could be like code reviews, it could be just like missing dependencies, things like that that might be easier tomorrow for you um, when you have a, a team growing. And finally, automate that um, with either uh, uh, continuous integration, scripting tools, and so on. Um, so yeah, that's it. Um, do you guys have any questions? Sure. Yeah, I'm Jin, and I want to know, uh, just wonder how many smoke tests uh, does your previous test have? How many what, sorry? Smoke tests does your previous test have? That, how many smoke tests am I the Pre-request. Pre-request. Yes. Um, so at the moment, uh, our testing is uh, separated between uh, we got like a specific mobile plugin. So it's it's not part of like the uh, presentation, is it? Your question? Uh, I just wonder. Uh, I just wonder how long does it take and uh, how how if it's long and uh, how to know how you handle that. Right. Okay. So I think. I mean, that would be great because we got like an uh, automation engineer there <laughs> behind, but I'm going to reply for him. Um, so I think uh, on the mobile side, we mainly do like uh, unit testing, um, but we got like a QA automation um, team that do also like UI testing and like all these parts of like uh, daily uh, smoke tests and all these parts. Um, I don't think it takes that much time. Um, so we just like um, break down tests in like specific areas of the app. So for instance, Zara e-commerce and checkout is like where we make money, so we make sure that it's not broken. Um, but we also got like a mobile backend, so like mobile backend have like their own small test and so on and so on. So slowly we kind of like the same as like I show you how to break down your application to make it easier to test. We do exactly the same in a bigger scale. Between like iOS, Android, uh, we use uh, APM for for UI and uh, mobile backend and like the rest of the backend and like all the CMS and so on and so on. Um, so on time, I can tell you uh, it would be like approximately uh, maybe like 30 minutes to an hour for like a full uh, sanity test. I would say. I have yeah? a question about uh, Swift format versus Swift Lint. Like we are also thinking of injecting it into our project, but is there an advantage of having both, or should if you have one, is that sufficient enough? I think I think it's like one, one is enough. Like I think it's more uh, depending on what you need. Uh, we use three formats here, but it it just depends on like what other tools you might use because some of them also implement sweet links at different levels. So you just might want to find like the ones that suit you best. It's kind of like the same as like you know, Cocoa uh, Buds or Cartage and kind of like find the right balance. So I think it's like the same for, I would say for you there. Yeah. Any other question? Yeah? Uh, do you use the Bazel distribution for buildings? Uh, Bazel? Yeah, we don't use, we don't use Bazel. <laughs> Sorry. No, no. Um, but it's kind of like something we also like try to explore because we got some like issues and probably like a lot of you if you use um fast lane uh the components like they like some API is broken and you're like wait how can I like fix that and you can see like a lot of people uh, moving to Basel. Um but again like we didn't have time to actually explore like what would be the benefits from it. Um, so yeah we haven't tested yet yeah. Uh, yeah. there's another tool for us we have been making a uh, intending to use, which is Commodore, I believe. Commodore. Yeah, it automates the entire process. And in that link, they did mention that we, uh, it's mentioned that we implement both Swift and then as well as Swift format. Okay. So, yeah. how is that? Why, why is that? So, what's your advantage of one or the other? Or um, I think, uh, to be honest, like the tools I show you, it just like show you alternatives and like one different ways. Um, so I'm not selling any solutions uh, specifically. 
So if this like all that sensitive, I would love to actually test it and see like if there's actually a benefit. Um, but again, it's kind of like why using maybe gen teams over cycle CI or thing like that. It just like I guess even like solution fits you the best. Um, so yeah. And uh, I, I noticed that you mentioned that we could remove the entire export uh, workspace as well as the export project if we are using the uh, gen was it? Was it to to regenerate export, export gen, yeah. So that means you it can be completely removed. It's quite similar to pods as in we run pod in it and pod install uh, once we pull from the repository. So is it quite similar to that? Yeah, yeah, correct. Um, the thing is like the more uh, the project, the more complex becomes the project, um, and maybe like the more like, the tricky it might be to adjust to like go to migrate to this. Um, but if at some point you want to like kind of like remove all that pain from conflicts, that might be like the time, like a good time to invest uh, and, and take those. But yeah, the, the idea would be like you can actually just regenerate the project whenever needed. Um, especially for CI, for instance, so it could, it could be like a really good fit. So then that means the, the developer needs to be working off the uh, tool to make it, uh, you know? Yeah, correct. So that's why I started with like code style and maybe like some like workflow, is because like you kind of like need to align all your team to make sure that, you know, it's like the way, kind of like the way you're going to use uh, the project, for instance. Correct. And uh, I also noticed that you never mentioned Jenkins. Rather, you oh yeah, so it's passing. Yeah, I, I kind of like hide behind C high because I'm not sure. Like I'm, some of you guys might have solutions. Jenkins like kind of like yeah, well known. So I didn't give you a lot about like CI because I assume uh, people might know actually. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. People. Actually, any other question? Cool. Uh, so it was like a long talk. I said it was like a lot of information. So yeah, I'm just gonna give it to the next one. Thank you guys.